My name is Jill Howell. I'm a senior environmental policy major, and I'll pre be presenting the sixth and final chapter of the Environmental Policy Review, Key Issues in Ethiopia 2011, entitled Rural Electrification and Renewable Energy. My research question was what renewable energy resources and technologies are available in Ethiopia that can lessen negative environmental impacts of current energy patterns, especially in rural areas. I broke this larger research question up into the following three parts. What is the current state of the rural energy sector? What renewable energy resources are available for electricity generation and which are the best suited to Ethiopia? And finally, what countries can serve as cases for Ethiopia to learn from? In order to answer my question, I first conducted a literature review of institutions governing the energy sector and the current state of rural energy use and access. Using spatial analysis through ArcGIS 10, I mapped the central electrical grid in relation to rural and urban areas to visualize disparities in access. Second, I reviewed available renewable energy resources and technologies and the benefits and challenges of each. Third, I looked to Uganda and Kenya as comparable cases in renewable energy that Ethiopia could learn from. The current use of traditional biomass fuels cannot meet demands of Ethiopia's growing population without compromising the health of the environment. According to a 2010 report by Ethiopian NGO Forum for Environment, the country relies on traditional energy, including charcoal and fuel wood, to meet 94% of their energy needs. This over-reliance on traditional fuels contributes to deforestation, land degradation, decreased agricultural yields, and greenhouse gas emissions. Currently, the energy sector is governed by a multitude of institutions, the majority of which are on the national level. The Ethiopian federal government creates energy laws, policies, and programs, while federal ministries manage resources, undertake research, and assist in policy formation. International institutions and development agencies often fund renewable energy projects, specifically those in rural areas. From this table, I want to highlight two institutions. The Ethiopian Rural Development and Promotion Center is responsible for the research and development of renewable energy technologies for rural areas. They administer the Rural Electrification Fund, which provides loans to electrification projects in areas left out of grid expansion plans. This is funded in part by the African Development Bank, a group that aims to reduce poverty and spur sustainable economic development in member African nations. Before diving into the current state of the energy sector, the grid system needs to be explained. In Ethiopia, the central electrical grid, or the interconnected system, supplies 98% of electricity and relies mainly on large-scale hydropower. The self-contained system is comprised of individual household technologies and of many grids fueled mainly by small-scale hydropower and diesel generators. The SCS supplies electricity to rural areas where the central grid does not extend due to high costs, low population densities, or geographic barriers. Currently, 87% of all electricity generated in Ethiopia comes from large-scale hydroelectric power. Ethiopia has embraced this technology because of their abundance of water resources. This map shows the 11 large-scale hydropower plants of the interconnected system. The larger the circle, the greater the capacity for electricity generation. The black lines represent medium and high-voltage transmission lines of the central grid. The orange shading mark urban areas, and the light color shows rural areas. In contrast to the last slide, this map shows the small-scale hydropower facilities of the self-contained system. These facilities are represented by much smaller circles, indicating that their capacity for electricity generation is significantly less than that of the large-scale hydropower facilities. They are located primarily in rural areas and are not connected to the transmission lines. With only 2% of electricity generation coming from SCS, most rural, while only 2% of electricity generation comes from the SES, most rural populations rely on these decentralized mini-grids for access to electricity. This map shows the combined hydropower facilities of the previous slides and also shows other electricity gener generating power plants. In addition to the 11 large-scale hydroelectric plants, there are 15 diesel plants represented, re represented by the yellow circles and one geothermal plant represented by the purple circle that comprise the ICS. As you can see, central grid lines and large-scale power plants are concentrated in urban areas, while rural er areas are left out, contributing to their limited electricity access and reliance on traditional fuels. 
The disparity between rural and urban energy access is reflected in data retrieved from the African Development Bank Group on 2005 cooking fuel use in Ethiopia. Highlighted in brown are access to traditional fuels and use of wood and charcoal. The numbers are high across the board, but they are especially significant for rural populations at 99.94% and 91.61% for access and use. Shown in yellow is electricity use for cooking. Here, I want to highlight how limited electricity access is to the nation as a whole. Only 0.02% of the rural population and 0.17% of the total population use electricity as cooking fuel. Although these numbers are lower than overall electricity access, which, according to the Ethiopian Electric Power Corporation, is estimated at about 5% in rural areas and 22% overall, they are still indicative of Ethiopia's current patterns of low energy consumption and electricity use. While the current energy sector is unsustainable, there are a number of available renewable energy resources and technologies that could decrease Ethiopia's reliance on traditional fuels. These resources and technologies are summarized here and include biogas, efficient cook stoves, solar, thermal, and photovoltaic, large and small-scale hydropower, wind, and geothermal. Each has various environmental and economic costs and benefits. I'm going to focus specifically on two of these efficient cook stoves, and geothermal. While fuel wood is a renewable resource, the problem that Ethiopia has encountered is that large stocks are being depleted faster than they are able to regenerate. Efficient cook stoves require less fuel and will alleviate some pressure from wood supplies. They are also affordable to individual households. Geothermal energy harnessed from the Ethiopian Rift Valley would be a clean way to generate electricity if challenges including high initial investment and limited technological knowledge can be addressed. Energy-efficient cook stoves and geothermal energy have been successfully implemented in Uganda and Kenya, respectively. Since 2005, the Ugandan Energy Savings Stove Project has brought over 500,000 stoves to Uganda. The use of local materials and involvement of local artisans has contributed to the project's success. Kenya has capital capitalized on geothermal energy from the Rift Valley to generate electricity. Since research began in the 1950s, Kenya has gained knowledge of the technology and has developed necessary financial institutions to fund these projects. Currently, rural households are meeting energy needs with traditional fuels because they lack access to more modern technologies, such as electricity. Investment in the energy sector and the development of alternative energy technologies often neglects rural areas. And while Ethiopia is following the worldwide trend of urbanization, the vast majority of its population still lives in rural areas and will continue to do so into the near future. Energy-efficient technologies may be exactly what Ethiopia needs. They provide an alternative to rural electrification and are relatively easy to implement because they are at a household level with no need for grid extension or creation. They are also affordable to individuals and can be implemented immediately, helping to alleviate the energy crisis in the short term. Also, Ethiopia can look to Uganda and learn from their mistakes and, and successes. The question is, though, is energy efficiency enough? In the long run, energy efficiency alone is not enough. Underlying the energy problem in Ethiopia is the dichotomy between pressing energy needs now and the need for long-term planning. While energy efficiency can and should be pursued immediately, Ethiopia cannot afford to lose sight of the future. Rural electrification through off-grid hydroelectric power is a place to start. Eventually, the central grid can be expanded and generation shifted away from hydropower and towards geothermal. Moving forward, Ethiopia needs to move away from its current reliance on traditional fuels. Ethiopia has the potential to do so, as there is an abundance of available resources and technologies. The implementation of these technologies should be guided by looking to past successes and failures of neighboring countries. Local NGOs can have a hand in disseminating household technologies and instructing people on how to use them, while international institutions may be sought out as financiers of these projects. My policy recommendations are broken down based on time. In the short term, Ethiopia should pursue energy efficiency through efficient biomass cookstoves. Simultaneously, they should continue research into electricity generating technologies, especially geothermal. In the long term, Ethiopia should pursue rural electrification. It may be through decentralized mini grids relying on small scale hydropower. Eventually, the central grid should be expanded to incorporate rural areas and geothermal explored as an option for electricity generation.